the Ortho PAC hosted by Sam Dyer. Welcome to the Ortho PAC where we discuss up-to-date orthopedic topics for the busy clinician. I invite you to sit back and relax as I attempt to fill in the gaps between education, current events, and real-world practice. Welcome back, listeners. This week, we continue our conversation with Dr. Robert Baranello in Strategies in Interventional Pain Management. So, yeah, I've done a great screening, a preoperative screening of the patient and, cut of you know, making sure they're tuned up, ready to go, not going to have an infection, their diabetes is managed. You do a trial before you actually do the implant to see if it's going to work. Can you just please go through the steps of that? Yeah, of course. Yeah. So once we've identified the patient is a candidate for this, our next step is, as I mentioned, moving forward with any new imaging that we would require. And that usually, you know, means a new lumbar spine and thoracic MRI if that hasn't been done within the last year or so. Following that, we generally send patients for a formal psychological evaluation, and that includes a usually one to two hour conversation with a licensed pain psychologist to make sure that they have the right insights and expectation management as far as their pain control goes moving forward. Make sure that they don't have any untreated psychologic, psychiatric, or other behavioral health comorbidities. And just make sure that they have an appropriate support system at home to make sure that they'd be able to help manage expectation management as far as pain management goes moving forward after the device. Once all of the pre-procedural stuff has been taken care of and the patient shows up to perform this trial, the patient will show up to either a clinic setting or an ambulatory surgery center or a hospital-based outpatient procedure center. And they will essentially have a discussion with the device representative. There are a variety of different devices and device manufacturers that have several different pros and cons that are probably outside of the scope of today's talk. But once that you and their patient have decided the device that you'd like to use and move forward with, we essentially perform a test drive. And so what that looks like is a temporary placement of usually two percutaneous spinal cord stimulator elite arrays and or dorsal root ganglion stimulator elite rays. Uh, we can also do trials for peripheral nerve stimulation. And those trials can be anywhere between seven days up to 60 days, depending on the device that you use. As we're sort of talking mostly about spinal cord stimulation, the process with placement of the leads is primarily fluoroscopic guidance. So those leads are generally placed with the aid of live fluoroscopic guidance. And again, percutaneously placed through a relatively small needle after epidural access has been obtained. Depending on the exact location of the patient's pain, we can be a little bit more specific about final lead placement, but generally it's around T7, T8, or maybe T8, T9 vertebral bodies. And then after the leads are placed and we're happy with the final lead placement, we secure those leads to the skin and we connect them to an external battery source. That external battery source is either taped to the side of the patient's skin or perhaps put in a fanny pack of sorts where the patient can carry around this external energy source uh, supplying all the energy required to provide the actual stimulation. And we send that patient home after some programming in the office or in the ambulatory surgery center, and they take that device home for a whole week. Typical trials are between five and seven days. And it's during that time where they have close, uh, pretty much daily communication with their device representatives, as well as myself and my staff, just to make sure that they have everything that they need and making sure that their experience is as fruitful as possible. We really want to try and maximize this time. And what do I mean by that? Again, I kind of use that analogy of a test drive. You know, each of these devices have a variety of different stimulation patterns, waveform patterns. Some of them can be paresthesia based, some of them can be paresthesia free, and a variety of patients have different preferences. And so I really want to make sure that one, we are covering their most painful areas with this. And two, um, that we've really maximized our ability to 
get pain relief and make sure that their experience of the neuromodulation and, and stimulation pattern is something that they'd be willing to live with, you know, and potentially for the rest of their life. You know, this is a permanent device and it's an important week to make sure that it's something that fits within their lifestyle. So let's say they, they get this external device and turn it on. How quickly will they notice improvement? How effective is it? Let's put it that way. Yeah. So I would say the majority of patients feel some degree of coverage and benefit almost immediately. During the programming phase, immediately after the percutaneous implantation of those leads, temporary leads, we want to make sure that that stimulation pattern is covering their most painful area before they leave the office. Because again, in this situation, seven days go by very quickly and every second counts. So we want to make sure that we set them up for success right from the get-go. I have had patients um, meet their device representatives at coffee shops for reprogramming if they need it. I've had them meet back up at the office to make sure that they check in with me, just to make sure that all of their, you know, we can do x-rays and make sure that there's been no lead migration. We can check impedances. Uh, on each of the contacts of those leads. And again, everything that we're doing is trying to maximize our chance of success with this because of how much time and effort has gone into the workup process, but also because for a lot of people outside of opioid management, this may be a last resort as far as getting some degree of meaningful and specific pain relief. So you get the implant, it's working great, and you decide, okay, let's go with the implant itself. I, I mean, you've done the trial, they had their week, and it's, it's really working. Decide to do it. What are the next steps for the patient? And what's their post-operative uh, period look like? Yeah, so the biggest difference between the trial and the implant is we move that external battery source to a more implantable pulse generator or IPG where that battery now becomes uh, under the skin and is placed subcutaneously. I'll often use the example of a pacemaker because I think a lot more people are familiar with that. And a lot of the devices that we use for spinal cord stimulation, for dorsal root ganglion stimulation, are, are the same companies that do make these cardiac implantable pacemakers and defibrillators. And so it is the battery looks quite similar. And so they're very small, generally thin, about the size of a silver dollar, let's say. And once we've had a successful trial and it's time to move forward with the permanent implantation, the rest is really up to scheduling. The actual procedure is a same day outpatient procedure. It is generally under MAC or conscious sedation, uh, but can also be performed under general anesthesia. Uh, and some of that I leave up to our anesthesiology colleagues as well. Outside of, you know, again, confirming correct final lead placement, making sure that we cover their most painful areas as we've maximized during our trial, and then placing an implantable pulse generator, which generally is either in the flank or in the buttock. Then uh, once that small pocket is created, that implantable pulse generator is sequestered into that pocket. The small skin incisions are closed up and I would say post-operatively, certainly some patients have some degree of, of post-operative pain at the injection site as well as at the pocket site, but usually after a long weekend or, or maybe up to you know four to five days, patients are, are back on their feet. I would say the most difficult part of the patient experience is some of the functional limitations immediately after this implant. And the limitations are there mostly to make sure that we minimize the risk of lead migration. We go through all this work to secure those leads in place and make sure that they're tied down and that they're not going to move. But for about four to six weeks is what I usually ask my patients to minimize any sort of bending, lifting, twisting motions so that we try to maximize the amount of time that those leads have a chance to scar in a little bit and significantly decrease the likelihood of any sort of migration afterwards. Seems like this should be like standard for someone having a laminectomy. You know, you get your laminectomy and you have your spinal implant done at the same time. You don't have there, to worry about it after that, you know? There, you know, there certainly is some evidence that's coming out about offering these types of therapy earlier 
there is cost involved always, and we have to consider about the cost to the patient, the cost you know, to the healthcare system as a whole. Um, but there's cost involved in waiting too. You know, there's cost involved when we try to, you know, um, send these patients back to physical therapy when we know it's not going to work or trying a litany of different prescription drugs. The list of conservative therapy goes on and on, and it is also not totally free of its cost. And so for the most part, even though this is quite an invasive procedure as it relates to some of the things that I do every single day, so say compare it to a, a knee injection or some medial branch blocks or you know radio frequency ablation, but as it compares to, to surgery, it is relatively minimally invasive and, and generally quite effective afterwards. So I would say, especially coming from, a, from an orthopedic group myself, I see a lot of patients get significant relief after formal decompression, laminectomy, but I tell patients all the time too that even though there's a mechanical and or structural cause of your pain, there's no guarantee that removal of that structural cause is going to essentially create a guaranteed pain relief. We know patients can have dysfunctional neuropathic pain postoperatively regardless of anatomic or structural causes of that pain. And again, complex regional pain syndrome is a perfect example. You know, patients can have neuropathic pain syndromes that are mediated by essentially autonomic nerve complexes, uh, sympathetic nerve plexuses that are causing the dysfunction of this pain. So it's not a sensory nerve. It's not a motor nerve, but these things can still happen after surgery. And so, so yeah, you're exactly right. I mean, there's certainly no guarantee that you're going to have any degree of pain relief after surgery, but on the same token, it's, it's certainly, you know, they, they, it has their role. I think this is fascinating. You know, if I've got to have a decompression, I'm going to say, Hey, can I get this? Listeners stay tuned next week when we continue our discussion with Dr. Robert Baranello in strategies and interventional pain management. The PAOS annual meeting is in Nashville, September the 2nd through the 6th. Get yourself registered and get your room reserved, and I hope to see you there.